Abraham was actually named Abram by his parents. God changed his name from Abram to Abraham later on. Abram's father, Terah, had three sons, Abram, Nahor, and Haran, in the city of Ur. In Genesis chapter 11, we read the exact date of each son born in the bloodline. Each father has a son at a certain date and then goes on to have other sons and daughters. But when it gets to Terah, when he was 70 years old, he had three sons, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Can we assume that they were triplets, all born in the same year? It seems that the whole lineage of Shem in Genesis chapter 11 is accurately recording the dates until the very last entry, the three sons of Terah. It may be that they were all born together. Abram's brother Haran died in Ur, leaving behind a son named Lot and a daughter named Milcah. Abram's brother Nahor married Milcah, the niece. Abram married a woman named Sarai. Terah, the father, then took Abram, Sarai, and Lot out of Ur to go into the land of Canaan. They settled, however, in Haran, where Terah, the father, eventually died. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran, 60 years before the death of his father. Genesis chapter 12, verse 4 tells us, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. Beginning Genesis chapter 12, we read that God called Abram. Here is the original calling. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, into a land that I will show thee. And I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. End quote. It is important to put this into point form because this very important blessing becomes modified as the story progresses and we want to monitor these modifications. Now here is the list of things that God blessed Abraham with. I will make thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. In thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Abram left Haran along with his wife, who was barren, and his nephew Lot. He seems to have had a substantial amount of goods and servants with him. He went into the land of Canaan, which was then occupied by the Canaanite. He camped in a place called Shechem, on the plain of Morah, in the land of Canaan. Shechem will become the site of many important events in Israel's history. Here, God declares to Abraham, Unto thy seed I will give this land. Abram then builds an altar and offers a sacrifice to Jehovah. We can now add to the blessings list for Abram. To the previous articles we add, Unto thy seed I will give this land, the land around Shechem. He then travels to another place and sets up camp on a mountain to the east of Bethel, with Bethel to the west and Hai to the east. Bethel and Hai are often mentioned together in the scriptures. This area also becomes significant later on. Abram built an altar there also, calling upon the name of Jehovah, but the scriptures do not record any answer from Jehovah. Looking at the second half of Genesis chapter 12, there was a great famine in the land of Canaan, and Abram went to Egypt to weigh out the famine. Abram's wife Sarai was very beautiful and attracted a lot of attention. So Abram says to her, You are beautiful to look at, and when the Egyptians see me, they will think you are my wife, and they will kill me to have you. Say that you are my sister, and they will let me live because of you. When they got to Egypt, Sarai was so beautiful and popular that she was taken to Pharaoh's house. Pharaoh liked her a lot, and he gave Abram gifts because he was her brother. 
and he was thinking of taking Sarai as a wife. Abram took the gifts of sheep, oxen, donkeys, camels, and both male and female human slaves. Jehovah sent great plagues on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife. It doesn't say how Pharaoh knew the reason for the plagues, but he went to Abram and said, Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Abram was then deported with all that he had. It seems he kept the gifts from Pharaoh also. Abram then took all of his riches and returned to the place between Bethel and Hai, to the altar he had built there before. And he again called on the name of Jehovah, and again No answer is recorded. Abram is called the father of faith, but so far Abram doesn't seem to be showing much faith in Jehovah. He lied to the Pharaoh because he was worried what would happen to him. If he believed that God was with him, he would not have been afraid of the Pharaoh. He may not have been afraid of the famine in the first place and not even gone to Egypt. He did gain a lot of riches though, but not in the best way. This story will tie into another story later on about Abraham. But first, we have another story about Abram. In the 13th chapter of Genesis, Abram's nephew Lot also had done very well financially. He had also gained many flocks and herds and tents, meaning many people. Abram and Lot were both leaders of two ever-growing companies. This shows the generosity and fairness of Abram. He allowed his nephew every opportunity to become independent and wealthy. Abram and Lot's herdsmen were in constant dispute over water and grazing rights. Abram tells Lot, We need to separate, because we are simply too big for the land to bear us. He gives his nephew first choice over the land, and Lot chooses the plain of Jordan a lush green plain with several cities of the Canaanites in it, including the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Finally, after Abram separated himself from Lot, then Jehovah appears again to Abram and says, Look north, south, east, and west. I will give all of the land that you see to you and to your seed forever. I will make your children as numerous as the dust of the earth, If you could count the dust particles, that is how many children you will have. So here God just gave Abram all of that land. Let us now check our blessings list for Abram. Along to what we've added so far, we will add also, I will make your seed as numerous as the dust of the earth, and I will give you the land in every direction as far as you can see. It seems that Jehovah effectively negated Abram's giving of land to Lot. He did not even mention Lot, but gave all of the land to Abram. Then Abram built an altar in Hebron and settled there. The battle of the nine kings is recorded in Genesis chapter 14. The king of Elam ruled over the land of Canaan for twelve years. This was most likely by collecting an annual tribute. However, in the 13th year, they rebelled and refused to pay. It seems the entire region rebelled against paying Elam in the same year. Kedar Loamer, the king of Elam, formed a coalition of three other kings with him and went to collect revenge. They attacked the Rephim in Ashtaroth Karnaim, Zizim in Ham, Emenin in Sharvet Karithim, the Horites in Mount Seir, and El Paran, which is by the wilderness. And they returned and came to Emishphet, which is Kadesh, and attacked the Amalekites and Amorites, which dwelt in Hazazormator. I can't trace all of these old places, but they're all generally in the area around Sodom and Gomorrah the lower valley of Jordan. Now these four kings who attacked were Amraphel, the king of Shinar, or Sumer, Arioch, the king of El Lesser, which is probably Lazar, Keralomar, the king of Elam, and Tidal, the king of nations. Five kings of the plain south of the Dead Sea formed a coalition to repel the attack. Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, 
Zebuam, and Bala. They join the battle in the Vale of Siddim, which is the Salt Sea. Four kings against five, the battle of the nine kings. These kings who join the coalition with the king of Elam are unknown to history. This coalition of four kings came to solidify Elam's power over the region and to collect slaves who were often used as a front line ahead of the army in battle. These slave soldiers would fight for a chance to be promoted out of the slavery and possibly into the regular army ranks. Now going back to the book of Genesis, when the four kings defeated the five in the Vale of Siddim, when the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fell and the three other armies retreated to the mountains, the four victorious kings took the booty of the cities. And Abram's nephew, who had been living in Sodom, was taken among the captives. During this time, Abram was still in Hebron or near Hebron, in the plain of Mamre. He had many servants. He had organized security. 318 of his servants were trained in warfare. These 318 were born in his house, meaning they were the children of his hired servants. Abram had no children then. In the battle of the nine kings, some that knew Abram had escaped and told him what had happened. Abram armed his 318 soldiers and pursued the four kings all the way to Dan. Abram divided his forces into groups and attacked them by night, all the way from Dan to a place near Damascus called Hobah. He used guerrilla warfare on them and defeated them. He recovered all of the goods and the slaves. The Bible then says this in Genesis chapter 14, verse 17. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Kedar and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shava, which is the king's dale. The king of Sodom fell in battle. This must be his heir that meets Abram. All we know about the battle is that it was a slaughter all the way from Dan to Hobah. Kedar Lomar was the leader of the coalition. All four kings fell in the battle. It was a great slaughter. But that's not important. What is more important is what happens next in the valley of Shava, the Dale of the Kings. In Genesis chapter 14, verse 18, we read, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which has delivered thy enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. End quote. The name Melchizedek translates as King of Righteousness, who is the king of the city of Shalom. Shalom means peace. This is said to be an earlier name of Jerusalem, mainly due to Psalm 76, verse 2. In Shalom also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion. End quote. Shalom is also mentioned one time in the Gospel of John. John chapter 3, verse 23. And John also was baptizing in Enon near Shalom because there was much water there and they came and were baptized." End quote. In the Christian epistle to the Hebrews, found in the New Testament, Melchizedek becomes a very prominent figure. Here the apostle is trying to convince the Jews of the significance of who Jesus is and why they ought to accept his gospel. He presents Christ as the high priest after the order of Melchizedek, which is a better order than the Levitical priesthood established through Moses later on. He points out the 110th Psalm. Psalm 110 verse 4, The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. End quote. This is a psalm about the coming Messiah. The epistle to the Hebrews explains the many subtleties about the priesthood and that Moses was directed to make everything after a pattern shown to him on the mountain. 
concluding that the Levitical priesthood through Moses, which needed sacrifice continually for sin, was inferior to the priesthood of Melchizedek in Jesus Christ, who offered himself once for all sin in the heavenly temple, which Moses was making a copy from. I could talk about this all night, but I will just read a portion of the epistle to the Hebrews to demonstrate the point of how Melchizedek fits into the new covenant. In Hebrews chapter 6 verse 17 we read, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor to the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek." End quote. Just to interject here, the veil he speaks of is the veil of the temple leading to the most holy place, the seat of God, which only the high priest of the temple could enter into once per year, in the Levitical priesthood, but in Christ's ministry the veil is in the heart of man. Now we'll continue with chapter 7 in the book of Hebrews. Chapter 7 verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Shalom, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, and unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily they that are the sons of Levi, who received the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take the tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them receives tithes of Abraham, and blessed him that had the promises, that is, Abraham. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed by the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receives them of whom it is witness that he lives. And as I may so say, Levi also, who received tithes, paid tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek, and not be called after the order of Aaron, which is the Levitical? For the priesthood being changed, there is made a necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there arise another priest, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. He, for he testifies, Thou art a priest, forever after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by which we draw nigh unto God. And inasmuch as not without an oath he was made a priest. For those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swore and will not repent, 
thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And they truly were many priests, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the utmost that come to God by him, seeing he lives forever to make intercession for them. For such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needs not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he did once when he offered up himself. For, for the law makes men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath which was since the law made the Son who is consecrated forevermore. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. To explain this basically, there was a, a priesthood set up under Moses under the law of Moses called the Levitical priesthood. It's called Levitical because it was the one tribe of Israel called the tribe of Levi were chosen to be the tribe of priests and they were placed under the Levitical law which is a law regarding uh, priests, how they dress, how they conduct their lives, how they offer sacrifices. Everything was very detailed and very uh, ritualistically laid out for them. Uh, what the writer of Hebrews here is saying is that the Psalms were written after the Levitical priesthood, and in the Psalms, God says to the Messiah, you are forever a priest after the priesthood of Melchizedek. So he is saying, well, why would God, after the Levitical priesthood was all set up, talk about another priesthood? And the priesthood he talks about is the priesthood of Melchizedek, which happened during the time of Abraham, before Levi was even born. He's, he even says that Levi, who was still inside Abraham, paid tithes to Melchizedek where now in the Levitical system, the people pay tithes to the priests. So he's basically, he's saying the uh, Levitical priesthood was a, co a copy of things in heaven, while the priesthood of Melchizedek is actually from heaven itself. And Jesus Christ is Melchizedek, or a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, who was given no birth, no death, no anything in the Bible. He appears and goes away. He is eternal. He's, he is presented as eternal. So this is the eternal priesthood who brought bread and wine for all and who blessed Abram. Now the bread and wine, of course, is also related to Jesus Christ because at the Last Supper, Jesus took the bread and said, this is my body. And he took the wine and said, this is my blood, and we have the communion sacrifice in Christianity, um, which is the, the very, the, the strongest symbols of Jesus Christ is bread and wine. So Melchizedek bringing bread and wine for all is very significant to Christian theology. After Abram is blessed by Melchizedek, he gives him a tenth of all the booty. The king of Sodom, who ran from the battle of the nine kings, where his own king fell, the new king of Sodom says to Abram, Give me the people, and you take the goods. The Bible doesn't reveal what his intentions were for these people. These were people from the entire region, not just Sodom. And the goods were the goods that once belonged to many of these people. Abram's answer is very telling. He says, I have lifted up my hand to Jehovah, the Most High God. 
meaning that he has sworn an oath to Jehovah, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that he would not take anything, not even a shoelace from him, lest he should say, I have made Abram rich, except for what the soldiers have eaten, and this does not include the rights over the goods of Abram's allies in the battle, Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre. They still get their share. These were the three Emirate or Emeru brothers who came to warn Abram in Genesis chapter 14, 13, and who went into battle with him. So Abram walked away from the whole affair with nothing for himself. But he did get blessed by Melchizedek, and he did keep his vow to Jehovah, and he did rescue his nephew from the slave market, 